Great, many thanks for inviting me. Um, so yeah, my name is Sophie Townend, and today I'm going to be giving a presentation about one of my PhD projects, which focused on identifying shared and distinct alterations in brain structure of youth with internalizing or externalizing disorders. And this project was conducted within the Enigma Working Groups for Antisocial Behavior, ADHD, Major Depressive Disorder, and Anxiety. And I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So psychiatric disorders are often classified into either an internalizing or an externalizing grouping, where the internalizing grouping is associated with internal distress, and it includes disorders such as anxiety and depression, and the externalizing grouping is associated with externally focused distress or behaviors, and this includes disorders such as ADHD and conduct disorder in youth. However, it's well documented that across these groupings, there's evidence of shared genetic and environmental risk factors, as well as overlapping patterns of comorbidity. So this has led to research which seeks to examine whether these cross-disorder similarities are also found in brain structure, and specifically whether structural alterations could be identified which could be transdiagnostic or shared across disorders, and what this might be able to tell us about what these different disorders could have in common. However, while the number of studies examining cross-disorder similarities in brain structure is increasing, there are still a lot of heterogeneous findings, and this is in part because a lot of studies have typically included quite small sample sizes, and these findings don't necessarily replicate. Also because of differences in data acquisition and analysis techniques between studies, which can limit our ability to kind of compare between these findings. Finally, there's currently still limited research that explores cross-disorder similarities in brain structure in child and adolescent samples. And this is important because this is when many of these internalizing and externalizing disorders first emerge. So within this project, we therefore focused on children and adolescents up to age 21. And we were interested in identifying whether there were any structural brain alterations which were common to disorders across the internalizing and externalizing groupings. And especially whether all four of the included disorders would show the same case control association in the same region, which we could describe as transdiagnostic. Additionally, we were interested in identifying whether any alterations might be common to disorders within the internalizing grouping only or the externalizing grouping only, or whether any would be specific to just one of the disorders we included. Although I won't be discussing these analyses in detail today, we were also interested in examining whether any structural alterations might vary by key participant characteristics, so looking at age and sex specifically. So to gather this data and overcome some of the limitations of previous research, we utilized the existing framework of the Enigma Consortium. I'm assuming most people are familiar with this, but I'm very happy to talk about this more at the end if needed. So in this project, we used data from four Enigma disorder-focused working groups, which included some of the most common internalizing and externalizing disorders in youth. So these were the Enigma Antisocial Behaviour Disorder Group, which contributed data from youth with conduct disorder, as well as the working groups for ADHD, anxiety disorders, and major depressive disorder. So for this project, we conducted a mega-analysis. So this is where the contributing research sites send the anonymized individual participant-level data to the main research site, rather than summary statistics for the whole sample, as would be done for a meta-analysis. So in our analyses, we corrected for site and scanner-related effects using the combat adjustment function, and then used linear models to compare each diagnostic group to healthy controls, as well as to each other, and assessed group differences in regional cortical thickness, surface area, and subcortical volume, all of which were averaged over hemispheres in our main analyses, at least. So these analyses controlled for age and sex, as well as total intracranial volume where appropriate. And as mentioned, we also tested for age and sex, sorry, age and sex interactions and conducted a number of sensitivity analyses, which again, I'm happy to talk about more at the end. This study was also pre-registered and you can access this via the QR code. So in this study, we had a total sample size of 8,780 children and adolescents, and these were gathered across 123 international research sites, including many countries which are typically underrepresented in neuroimaging research. So here you can see some key characteristics of our sample. So as I mentioned, the total sample size was 8,780. And here you can see that the healthy control group made up about half of this sample. You can also see that there was about 1,000 individuals in each of our diagnostic groups. That is except for the MDD group, which had a sample size of 504. 
So now looking onto the results and starting with surface area. So in surface area, we found that there were many shared associations across the four included disorders, including transdiagnostic associations. So for instance, across each of the four disorders, we saw, re saw reduced surface area in the entorhinal cortex, the insula, and the middle temporal gyrus relative to healthy controls. So the insula in particular has been implicated in a lot of previous cross-disorder research in adults, looking at both brain structure and function. And this is involved in autonomic response regulation, attentional switching, and threat-based responses. So we do see dysfunction um, in all of these disorders in these areas. We also identified externalizing specific reductions, so specific to ADHD and conduct disorder, and these were found in several frontoparietal regions. So these regions support higher order cognitive control. So these alterations could relate to deficits in working memory, attentional um, biases, and cognitive control, which are typically seen in externalizing disorders. Additionally, when we looked across the disorders, we found that youth with conduct disorder showed the most widespread alterations in surface area relative to healthy controls. So specifically, they showed lower surface area in 21 out of the 34 regions we studied. So this bar graph shows Cohen's D effect sizes for each diagnostic group relative to the control group. And here, the stars at the bottom indicate where there was a significant FDR-corrected reduction in surface area relative to healthy controls. And the comparison lines in the top portion of the graph indicate where there was a significant difference between diagnostic groups, so between ADHD and conduct disorder, for instance. So as well as the regional differences that I indicated on the previous slide, you can also see that all four disorders were characterized by a global reduction in total surface area. You can also hopefully see that there was a general pattern that lower surface area relative to healthy controls was very common, but there were no instances where surface area was significantly increased relative to controls. Looking now at our results for cortical thickness, so overall we found that there were very few associations in this outcome measure. We did find that reduced precentral gyrus thickness was common to the ADHD, anxiety, and MDD groups, but overall the results were very limited. So it is perhaps a little surprising that results were so rare for cortical thickness, and we did also find that effect sizes were a lot smaller in this outcome measure when compared to surface area, for instance. And this does run contrary to findings of studies in previous um, kind of smaller samples that have been reported, which have often implicated cortical thickness alterations in youth psychopathology. However, this pattern is consistent with findings from previous large-scale projects, such as the Enigma studies for ADHD and MDD. Finally, looking at subcortical volumes, so here we found that all four of our disorders displayed lower amygdala volume relative to the healthy control group. Interestingly, both the insula and the amygdala are key nodes within the salience network. And for anyone unfamiliar, the salience network is involved in the detection and integration of salient stimuli. So alterations and dysfunction of this network could be related to um, kind of the misattribution of attention to certain stimuli in the environment, which could subsequently lead to maladaptive behavior, such as threat-based responses and attentional biases. Finally, as seen for surface area, we again found that the youth with conduct disorder showed the most widespread case control associations in, in, in subcortical volume. So here they showed lower volume relative to controls in five out of the seven regions we studied. So as a quick summary slide, relative to healthy controls, the four psychiatric groups were characterized by lower surface area in the insula, the entorhinal cortex, and the middle temporal gyrus, as well as lower amygdala volume. So these findings replicate those previously reported in adults, suggesting that youth disorders also show transdiagnostic alterations in regions involved with salience attribution and emotional processing. So while we didn't observe any alterations that were specific to the internalizing disorders, we did find externalizing specific reductions in surface area and frontoparietal regions. And as I mentioned, these are implicated in behaviors we typically see in externalizing disorders. In the interest of time, I haven't been able to describe these findings in much detail, but I wanted to quickly touch on this. So we did find that there were seemingly disorder-specific effects for the ADHD, conduct disorder, and anxiety groups, but not for the MDD group. Youth with conduct disorder showed the most extensive alterations compared to controls, showing really widespread reductions in both surface area and subcortical volume. And we found this quite interesting because conduct disorder is relatively under-recognized and understudied of these youth disorders. But these findings suggest that youth with this disorder actually show some of the most extensive brain structural alterations. Obviously, there are some limitations of our work, and I wanted to quickly highlight three points here that I thought were relevant when interpreting our findings. 
So firstly, we were unable to systematically investigate the impact of comorbidity in these analyses due to inconsistent availability of this information across studies. So this represents a bit of a drawback of using secondary data. And we really would recommend that this is a focus in future studies as it's likely that this impacted our identification of both shared and specific effects. Secondly, it should be noted that the sample of youth with MDD was a lot smaller than the other groups, as I previously mentioned. So our finding of no MDD-specific effects could be due to insufficient power to detect certain structural alterations. And then finally, we, um, in this project, compared groups, um, kind of unitary groups, with categorical diagnoses. But of course, we know that there's a lot of heterogeneity within each of these diagnostic categories, both in terms of symptom severity and symptom profiles. So by averaging across these groups, we might lose quite a lot of detail, as only a subset of individuals within a diagnostic group could show brain alterations. And this likely also explains the fairly small effect sizes that we observed. We would therefore recommend the application of machine learning and normative modelling approaches in the field of youth psychiatric disorders to explore this further. So to conclude, we conducted the first mega-analysis comparing brain structure in youth with common internalising and externalising disorders and identified shared associations within, across the four diagnostic groups. Future studies could be guided by these findings, for instance, by examining how common alterations in the salience network could give rise to these different forms of psychopathology, as well as exploring the impact of comorbidity and examining heterogeneity within diagnostic categories. I'd like to just quickly thank the Economic and Social Research Council for funding this work, my supervisory team and the co-chairs of the included Enigma working groups for their extensive support, as well as the many researchers who contributed their time and data to the project. I don't know how we're doing for time, but in case anyone does have any questions, I'm doing a poster later on today, so you can find me at poster number 498. Thank you very much. I think we'll take time for one quick question. So, have you considered looking at hierarchical models of psychiatric disorders for something like this? Uh, someone suggested the, the high top. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Completely. So, yeah, this is actually a project that I'm doing as a follow up study now. I am not actually looking at the high top due to differences in um, the availability of psychiatric measures across different samples. But we're looking at currently doing a P-factor model, so a general psychopathology model, and um, examining internalizing and externalizing factors within that. So that's something we're currently doing. Um, and we have um, data for about 10,000 participants looking at the child behavior checklist, but in specific. But at the moment, we're still in the data cleaning phase, so I can't give any more insight. But this is something we're definitely interested in because it'll be really interesting to see if the results that we find as transdiagnostic when looking at categories of diagnoses also translate when we're looking at dimensional measures of psychopathology. So that's something we're definitely looking at and really interested for those results to come out. Thank you very much for a great talk. Thank you.